You need that because there's been so much fraud. Justice Department under George Bush investigated voter fraud, found 0.0003% fraud, no fraud. It's a solution looking for a problem rather than a problem looking for a solution. But what was also strange, going back to me knowing what's going on in Alabama, is that once you require this government photo ID, people could go to the DMV to get ID. In 10 of the mostly black counties or majority black counties in Alabama, in eight of the top 10, you closed the DMV where blacks were the majority. So you tell us to go get something and then close the ability to get it. Now, what also is confusing is your president, the president, just said that three or four people voted illegally, which is why Mrs. Clinton got 2.8 million more votes than him. Now, I want to know how some illegal people and some immigrants could come in the country, some already in the country illegally, according to him, and they could get some government photo IDs, and we couldn't get them in eight counties in Alabama. You gonna tell me the folk that are here illegal are gonna go and find a way to get some photo IDs from the government that they hiding from. <laughs> so they can go and vote against Trump. the man to be the head of the Justice Department that said it was intrusive, that said that he was standing against the reform acts around policing and criminal justice. I said, explain to me why we wouldn't be opposed to that. And in case you thought I wouldn't bring it up in Alabama, stay tuned or come to church with me tonight. In fact, they can circle the plane a little bit because I'm not finished. We fought too long. Spent too many nights in jail. Took too many beatings. We lost an election. We've not lost our minds. Tonight, as I speak, standing up, all of us are not having an hallucination. All of us are not imagining things. We're not seeing three million folks that's not there. We're seeing a man doing things that would undermine the achievements that have been made in the last 50 years, and we are not going to back down because we didn't get them by backing down. <laughs> Some will say, well, I don't know. I, I'm not into all of this marching to keep voting rights. How do you think we got voting rights? <laughs> it amazes me how so-called intelligent people act like folk just woke up one morning and gave us the rights we got. We fought for the rights that we got and we're going to have to fight to keep those rights. And everybody's not going to be with us, but everybody never was. Don't let me tell a lot of young people here tonight, Everybody telling you about what they did back in the day didn't do it. 
There wasn't a million men marching till 95. There never was a million folk marching in the 60s. People tell me all the time, you stop at the airport in Charlotte, change your prayer. Right now, I voted for you president in 2004. If everybody that stopped me had voted for me, we'd be having this service in the White House. <laughs> Don't ever wait to get everybody on your side. Stand up with the minority that will stand up with you and stand up even if you got to stand up by yourself. You don't need a crowd to do what's right. You need the conviction and you need the commitment of who you are and what you are and what God put you here for. We have gotten into this era of wanting everybody's approval. And some of us need to speak clear in a time of unclear atmosphere. Well, one of the things that I have two daughters and both of them grown and they got me into all this social media stuff. <laughs> and you know, a lot of our young people, everything is social media. My daughters tell me, don't, don't. Dad, if they trap me, they'll tell me, Dad, don't, don't buy the newspaper. You don't read the newspaper no more. <laughs> Do it all online. <laughs> we go to dinner. I'm sitting across the table from them. They'll text me, what you gonna eat? I said, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> but they done taught me all this stuff. Now they wish they hadn't, because the youngest one, 29, and I ask her, well, you, you coming to the rally? We have rallies every Saturday morning. Yeah, I'm coming, uh, I'll be a little late, because went to Bible class last night. I said, you did? Yeah, I, I went to Bible class late. I said, it's funny because the lady looked just like you on Instagram was at the club last night. <laughs> <laughs> so they wish they hadn't taught me all this stuff. <laughs> but the danger of social media if it's misused, because anything could be good or bad, it's caught how you use it. Is that you uh, get caught up in the what will get you the most likes, rather than what is what is right. So you get rattled if somebody send you a bad message. Be more caught up on the message you send than the reply you get. And it's gonna get worse because y'all got a Twitter president now. He <laughs> <laughs> get up the other night just to change everything. They spent the whole evening trying to take back proclamations he sent that he really didn't mean what he meant. <laughs> he not banning this. He said that's what he was banning. As a minister, I got a problem with banning anybody based on religion. Because if you ban one religion, it gives you the power to ban my religion. And we are not a country built on a one religion, it's a freedom of all religions. But I am a believing Christian. And it's hard, even in a religious context, for me to agree with this ban. Since the Bible, in the same book that I read from, tells me in Matthew that when Jesus came and the wise men visited him to bring gifts and God certified it was his son, by putting the star in the east. Don't stop there, Mr. 
Mr. and Mrs. Pro Trump fan, keep reading. It says an angel came and said that Herod is plotting to kill you. Take the boy and flee to Egypt. Why are you going to Egypt? Because you can hide there with find refuge, which means I worship a refugee. And I'm not for banning refugees. in trouble. So before you get this knee-jerk reaction, let us first look at what we're really talking about. So we're in the middle of a storm. We're in the middle of tumultuous time. Every major airport, people marching in there. Millions of women marched last week. Thousands of us marched around civil rights in the icy rain. We're in the middle of a storm. President, every day, got another controversy going. And many people are depressed, some concerned, People stopping me all over the country telling me white and black, they're frightened. And someone asked me yesterday, why are you so calm? Well, first of all, I've been in storms before. I, I, I fly a lot. One thing I learned is that when you fly in and you hit turbulence, you don't get up and put on your emergency stuff and get a parachute ready, get ready to jump. You just tighten your seat belt and just ride through the turbulence until you hit air. We've been through storms before. In fact, we were born in storms. But those of us of faith, more than anybody else, ought to know what to do in a storm. Yeah. And let me tell, again, the young folk in the audience, we went through slavery, mm -hmm. reconstruction, mm -hmm. 100 years of segregation, mm -hmm. economic deprivation, mm -hmm. went and fought wars, <laughs> and the folk we fought had more rights when they came in than we had when we got home. Mm -hmm. I had uncles here in Alabama that fought World War II and come home and the Germans they fought could check in hotels and eat in restaurants that they couldn't eat in and couldn't check in the hotel. We've been through storms before. We went through the civil rights movement watching our leaders killed. After that, we went through the conservative era of Nixon then Reagan, we face things tougher than Donald Trump. <laughs> Don't panic now. Think about what you've been through. And use what got you through to get you through now. <laughs> Let me say this. I wrote in my text, Senator Sessions needs to deal with voting rights and say that he will uphold voting rights and he will condemn the closing of the DMVs in the eight majority counties that were closed in Alabama. He needs to stand up and say he will continue the police reforms that President Obama's commission came with and commuting sentences of low-level drug offenders that were nonviolent that should not be given an ordinary amount of time should stand up and say he will enforce the laws of equal employment and if he can't do those things he should not be confirmed as the Attorney General of the United States. Now I'm not 
naive. I know Trump is going to be Trump. I've known Trump a long time. I marched on Trump during the Central Park Five case. About two weeks after he was elected, the president, he called me, said, we're going to disagree, we're going to fight, but we're going to agree on some things. I said, well, I don't know what that is, but we will see, but we sure are going to have our fights. He said, well, we'll get together. I said, well, as long as you meet with other heads of national civil rights organizations, I'm not doing one meetings. I'm not, this ain't the red carpet for a reality show. This is serious business. Other folks go meet with them if they want. I want witnesses and agenda and a report. Names took him from. 
from them. Well, they didn't even know their own name, named after their masters. Yeah. Guess the law to marry their wives. Guess the law to name their children after them. What would make you get up and keep going? They believed that if they kept going, that somehow God would make a way for their children. Somewhere along, as we made the most progress, many of us have lost that faith. They formed black institutions when it was against the law for us to walk on the curb. And now you running around wondering if we can still educate ourselves. <laughs> They fought for the right to vote when they could legally whip you down. And now somebody got to beg you to come and use a vote that others suffered and died to give you. We lost our faith and now we're in a storm. And we're scared not because Jesus is asleep, but we are found out that we lost our internal strength. What do you do in a storm? Well, after you get Jesus, you got to believe that he can make it through the storm. Well, wait a minute. How are you going to make it through? What is the strategy? First of all, don't lose your faith. Because all Jesus did was get up and speak to the wind. And speak to the waves. Because if you're connected to your spiritual power, even the wind and the waves shall obey his will. Read it, I'm not scared of Trump, Sessions, and the rest of them. If there is another power. Sometimes, what looks like you're going backwards may be a test to see if you're strong enough to keep going forward. Go back in the Old Testament and read where the Israelites were slaves. They prayed, they fasted, they wanted God to deliver them. God sent Moses, raised them up right in Pharaoh's house. When Moses found out who he was, went out and sought to see God, God turned him around, told him to go back and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Put seven plagues on Pharaoh. Six of them, Pharaoh kept equivocating back and forth. Finally, God said, all right, I'm going to let my death angel rise. Said, I'm going to release the death angel to ride through Egypt. And the death angel ain't gonna do no interviews. She's just gonna ride through and take the firstborn of every man in every house that doesn't have the blood of the lamb on his doorpost. Not gonna talk to nobody, not gonna ask nobody their background, their pedigree, their lineage. Just look for the blood on the doorpost. And if they see the blood on the doorpost, the death angel's going to pass over. That's where Passover comes from. That's why a lot of folk that's running around bragging and arrogant and self-important, they didn't get there because they fought. They never marched one step with us. They never spent no night in jail. You got there because some of us put our blood on your doorpost. I was debating a conservative, self-described black conservative. And he told me, he said, Reverend Al, I am into all that protest and marching stuff you do. Civil rights didn't make me. 
Look at my resume. I went to the best schools. I'm a right member of the right fraternities. I have the right connections and contacts. Read my resume. He put it down. I looked at his resume. I said, yes, it's very impressive. You did go to the right schools, got the right connections, right fraternities and all that. And you're right. Civil rights did write your resume. But civil rights made somebody read your resume. <laughs> qualified before you, but don't you ever forget that some unleaded, unread grandmothers laid down in Birmingham and laid down in Mississippi and sponsored you to these Ivy League schools you come from. You didn't get hit by yourself, and you owe it for those that pay the price to not get to the 21st century and get trumped now. <laughs> We've been in storms. And I've come to tell you, don't panic in this storm. Come together and fight through the storm. And know that if we stand up, that God will be for us. And somewhere I read that if God be for you, it's more than the whole world against you. We cannot compromise on right. And we cannot back up. And sometimes you're going to have to walk with those that don't look like you. But you've got to make friends with those that are friends with what is right. Red Mal seems like they got it stacked. They had it stacked a long time ago. But I still believe that in the midst of the storm, that I can hear God's voice challenging us to do what is right. And we will be judged not by the storm, but how we respond to the storm. Let me break this down, I'll let you go. It's also true in your personal life. Mm -hmm. A lot of y'all going through challenges. A lot of y'all are in dilemmas. A lot of you don't know what to do and where to go. You find yourself running around in circles. And I come to tell you tonight, the way out of your personal dilemma is to know that God didn't make a mistake when he brought you here. You were not born for a season, you were born for a reason. And if you answer the call that God gave you, don't check with your friend. Don't check with your relative. Quit asking everybody, do you think I can do this? Do you think I can do that? God don't need no co-signer to get you to do what he wants you to do. Fulfill your calling. I, I, I go places and people come to me real bad. Here's my resume. I've got all the right supporting documents. Everybody loves me. Everybody speaks well of me. Nobody speaks ill of me. I never made a mistake, never been in trouble. There's no smear to my name. But then don't hang out with me. I mean, if you that clean, then I don't want you around me because if you run with me, we liable to get into something. And if you ain't never been into nothing, I don't know if you can take getting into something. I like to hang out with folk that been through something. Brother Ford traveled with me, tell you, I 
fly through good weather, bad weather, don't matter to me, early, late, long as we go where we have to go. The only time he has a problem with me getting on the plane is if they tell me it's the pilot's first trip. <laughs> they tell me he's been checked out, he's been to pilot school, got all of his credentials, I got that. But just something about the thought. <laughs> this is the first time he going up and we may hit some turbulence. He ain't never been in charge of powers before. I don't want to be up there when the first time he figured out. <laughs> or we may hit some clouds and he's the first time he's in charge of radar. What am I saying? You like these clean, pristine, proper folk? That ain't never been tested, ain't never been through nothing, ain't never had their heart broke, ain't never cried at night. I don't want them kind of friends. I like to be with folk that been knocked down and dragged through the mud, been smeared, and been Saturday 
at our rally that we were going to have that Saturday. I met with my little staff, much smaller then, and one of the sisters in the staff said, Red Man Al, you know you can't bring them to church with you tomorrow. I said, why can't I bring him to church? She said, well, he won't understand our kind of service. I thought about it. I said, yeah, you're right, but if he doesn't go to church with me, he won't know my story. So I waited until late that Saturday, and I said, let me tell you something. Sir, tomorrow, I'm going to bring you to church with me. He said, I'm, I'm very interested in that. I, I've been intrigued by the black church. <laughs> I said, what you mean by that? He says, well, y'all are so passionate and expressive. And where I go to church, we are so sedate and sing anthems and laid back. And I've always wanted to understand the passion. I said, well, I'm going to pick you up early and we get to church. He says, maybe you'll explain some things to me. I said, all right. We got to church. We stood out in the midst of you. And as we were coming in, he said, hold it right now. That's what I'm talking about. There's a man on the left-hand side of the church, about three hours back, and he keeps doing his hand like this. <laughs> what does that mean? I said, oh, you don't know that man? That man's name is Brother Jones. And Brother Jones had been diagnosed with cancer. Gave him about four months to live. I remember that Friday night he came to prayer meeting. I was sitting in the pulpit so I could hear him when he got on his knees and called on God. He said, Lord, you a doctor that never lost a patient. There's more medicine in the hem of your garments than any pharmacy in town. If it be your will, I want you to heal my body. That was about six years ago. And he's still here. He was supposed to have been gone in four months. But six years later, every time he comes to the church, all he do is just wave his hand. He said, all right, I, I think I got that, but what about that lady up in the quiet stand? She keeps clapping her hands up and down. What's her story? I said, well, that lady lost everything she had, but she's got on her knees. And she said, the Lord give it, and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Everything she lost, God brought it back because her faith made her whole. She made it through her storm. I got to go now to the pulpit. He said, wait, I got one I just don't understand at all. There's a lady on the right-hand side. She's about six rows back. It's the most awkward thing I ever seen. She jumps up out of seat. She kind of falls to the side. It looks like she don't fall down, but she won't fall down. But she can't stand up. But she keeps jumping up and down. While she's kind of tilted to the side. What is she doing? What is her story? I said, oh, you don't know that lady's story. Her and her husband built a business. They did so well that they moved their family from the hood to the suburbs. Had a little girl and a little boy. Put them in the better schools. Used to buy them nice outfits. They got so well off. They could buy a brand new Cadillac every Christmas. But one day, the woman woke up and her husband had run off with a child from a first marriage. He broke up her home. She held on as long as she could. They cut off her gas. They cut off her lights. Her little girl and little boy had to do their homework by candlelight. All of their friends, 
that used to look up to them were laughing at them, talking about their daddy abandoned them, talking about they had no lights. They finally lost the house and they had to move back to the hood. They took and repossessed her Cadillac. But she walked to the train every morning, going downtown to scrub floors. And she called on God. She said, Lord, if I never have a house again, it'll be all right if you take care of my little girl and my little boy. Lord, if I never have a Cadillac again, it'll be all right if you take care of my little girl. seat in the pulpit, but after taking two steps, I turned back and said, the reason I know her story is I'm her little boy. Stop!